Hello, I'm Professor Corey Wren, and this is part three of my three-part series on gender and speciesism. In the first part, I talked about how we ascribe different gender norms to non-human animals and how their gender uh, will dictate how they are exploited by humans. In part two, I talked about the intersections of uh, sexism and speciesism, a little bit of racism and speciesism. Uh, so this is going to be pulling off of that and talk specifically about masculinity and speciesism. A lot of this presentation is going to be based on the work of Carol Adams, who is a vegan feminist. If you are interested in this uh, presentation and you want to learn more, definitely check out some of her books. The Sexual Politics of Meat is probably her most famous one, but also The Pornography of Meat, which is, I think, a little bit more accessible. Um, so she basically argues that non-human animal flesh is associated with strength and vitality, uh, vitality rather. So when we're talking about veganism and animal rights, we have to uh, keep in mind that masculinity issue where uh, eating meat is considered manly and to eat vegetables is considered to be uh, feminine. So vegetable and legume sources might offer the same nutrition, but they're always going to be seen as inferior because they've been feminized. And we live in a patriarchal society, so all things feminine get devalued. Vegetarianism and veganism has long been associated with women and the overly emotional. So um, whereas both men and women will be vegan and vegetarian, it's always been feminized because meat is associated with masculinity. And what is meat? Meat is... Uh, Know, the objectification of a living being. It represents domination, male domination over feminized bodies. Um, and also, this overly emotional aspect is because uh, eating animals has been so naturalized. It's seen as a normal and natural thing. So if you have a problem with that, then you're just being overly emotional about something that's supposed to be natural. Uh, consumption of non-human animals and their products is both tied to the traditional ideals of manhood and domination over nature as well as the modern notions of scientific and technological advancements. David Nybert has a really excellent book on this topic. Oh, it's somewhere in a stack of books of mine. I can't find it. Um, human Impression and uh, Animal Rights and Human Rights, I think is what it's called. And he has a, a, a newer book on uh, animal oppression and human violence. And basically he's making the argument that uh, all human oppression really roots in animal oppression. So it, in earlier human societies, it was very egalitarian. Everyone pretty much did the same thing, uh, very plant-based. If there was any meat eating, it was uh, scavenging and insects. But then with some geological changes, we had uh, large open spaces with large migratory animals. Then hunting became more feasible. And that's where you start to see the division of labor because women were kept back home on home base so they could maintain a supply of more reliable foodstuffs because hunting was very erratic and you couldn't always depend on that. Um, and as we have the separation, as with any separation, once you have that, there's not equal, there's not, you can't have separate but equal rather. So what happens is men's um, work starts to be valued because it's uh, very, resource intensive and it's risky and then women's more reliable reliable drudgery work really is not is becomes devalued um so as humans began to hunt over 20 about 20,000 years ago this created this new social arrangement and was less egalitarian and we have this unequal status of women really beginning and so inequality of gender is tied to inequality of species so the oppression of non-human animals is inextricably, inextricably linked with that of the oppression of women and other minorities. And I really recommend you checking out his book if you want to learn more about that process. Brian Luke is another um, really awesome author. I really suggest that you check out. Um, he has a book called Brutal, and that explores masculinity and animal rights and speciesism. He also has a chapter in Carol Adams' book, um, Animals and Women. He has another chapter somewhere else I can't remember offhand, but all of the stuff that I've read is just really, really fascinating. Uh, so he's really, he's, he he adds a little bit to the bright, uh, David Nybert's explanation. Um, so remember David Nybert is saying that once we have hunting, we start seeing that division of labor 
uh, Brian Luke adds that women have always been considered givers of life in a positive sense through childbirth and breastfeeding. So now we have men who are uh, giving life in more of a negative way by taking uh, the lives of the animals that they kill. So whereas women had a lot of value before as being the primary life givers, now men, after we have this division of labor, are giving life through the calories that they bring in through the animals that they kill. So again, this is part, this is where we see this gender hierarchy being created and it's based on the oppression of animals. And in modern times this continues. We have um, many life-giving institutions that are based in, in death or um, male-led. So animal testing, vivisection, it's mostly men who lead that. And of course what's the point of that is to advance science and to save lives. Slaughterhouses are staffed mostly by men and that's providing food so that's again another source of negative life giving and today hunters tend to be mostly male as well so men's domination of non-human animals is a way of reinforcing hierarchies of power um, it puts men on the top and men control and men dominate and it's done through violence whereas from the feminist perspective it's more relational um, and more empathetic relationship with others in the community and life is given in a more positive way. So systems of non-human ex exploitation tend to be dominated by men and the animal rights movement is dominated by women. And this is important when we're thinking about um, the history of our relationship with non-human animals with men primarily being violent towards animals and dominating animals and with women having a more relational approach to the natural world. And so we see this reflected in the politics of the non-human animal rights movement today, where it's uh, mostly women who are animal rights activists because of this association between women and animals. And with, uh, with men actually taking a lot of the uh, leadership positions within the animal rights movement. But Brian Luke talks a lot about how um, there's this dichotomy that's created between activists who are mostly women and then the counter activists or the institutionalized exploiters who tend to be mostly male. And in the beginning of the book he talks about he, how uh, really stark that contrast is when he's exploring a pigeon shoot and it's the women who are protesting and then the men who are hunting, shooting, shooting the birds and then harassing the women for speaking up about it. Um, so human and non-human violence in these masculine uh, institutions it's not just about uh, the men and the animals that they kill, but it's also um, it has further reaching implications. So there's lots of research that shows links between violence against non-human animals and domestic violence. There's links between slaughterhouses and community violence. So once the slaughterhouse comes into the community, you see crime rates uh, increase. And we also see intersections between masculinity and race and speciesism. I apologize for the uh, uh, triggering image there. Um, prior to abolition, African Americans were framed as loyal and obedient, faithful servants. But then after slavery, they were cast as dangerous wild beasts. They were seen as a threat to virginal white females, and this served to humiliate black women as well, because uh, if black men are just after white women, then that means black women must be so awful that no one wants them. Uh, so what we're seeing here is uh, black masculinity is animalized in a way, and in a way that prote protects white male supremacy. And when we have this association, once black men have been animalized in such a way, then it allowed for really gross discrimination, a lot of uh, large-scale violence, mass lynchings, uh, and then of course just institutionalized uh, racism and violence as well. And we see this continues a lot today with um, uh, racism against black men that's, that continues to animalize them. Another thing about uh, the interlap, you know, interconnections between uh, masculinity and um, speciesism, when we talk about, with Carol Adams' work, she looks a lot at how women are sexually objectified and turned into meat. 
And she talks about this in one of her books is where we try to say, a lot of times we try to counter that and say, uh, well, men are objectified too. Look at, we call them beefcakes, that big hunk of man or things like that. Um, but it's just not accurate to say that women and men are equally sexually objectified. First off, 95% of sexual objectification in the media portrays women. And so even with that small remainder of men who are sexually objectified, usually what happens is their, their manliness is protected, their personhood is protected, um, and usually they're selling something other than uh, body parts. And so when they're presented in these images as beefcakes, their, their, their maleness is still being confirmed. They, their power is still preserved. Their integrity is not compromised as it is with women. And there's, his sexual agency is there and it remains his. Instead of being acted upon, he's acting upon other things. Uh, so he has command over his space. And another consideration is the beefcake mu muscle is above cheap cuts and pieces of meat. This is drawn on Cap Carol Adams' work. Because adult males eat females, castrated males, and babies. And so, again, this, that, this hierarchy is preserved of male dominance and feminized bodies who are kept uh, at the bottom of that stratum. And also, when we talk about um, language that we use to dehumanize women, again, we might say, well, we call men male chauvinist pigs. And this is from uh, Carol Adams' book. I think this is from Pornography and Meat. She has a chapter on this if you want to read more about it. Um, it just doesn't work the same way. Just in the same way you can't say that men and women are equally sexually objectified, you can't say that both men and women are both um, equally affected by uh, degrading language. First off, there's maybe 200 words or so that are used to degrade women, but not nearly as many of men. And many times the, the words that are used to degrade men involve a woman in a way, like a uh, bastard or son of a bitch, which both refer to women and degrade women. And Carol Watt Adams also points out that it's really not um, it's not fair to use this language against men. If it's a lot of times feminists like will retort and say you chauvinist pig. Well, then we're using pig as an insult, and so that's engaging speciesism. And really, it's not about men being pigs. It's about their human male privilege, which is culturally constructed. It also attempts to dehumanize men as well, and the whole point of our social activism is trying to bring everyone up to the same level, not bring some people down. And this also takes a word that's associated with degrading women. We think of women as being called pigs, and it just doesn't work when we use it on men. It just balances off because men are the, uh, the the majority group. So pig and sow is associated with women. Boar really doesn't have, there's no male equivalent in our language. It doesn't really have much meaning except for an actual physical boar. Um, and so a lot of times men have kind of taken these this insult on and they just joke with it because there's nothing, it doesn't really hurt them. And I know that women have tried to do this with the slut walk, try, but it just, it doesn't work exactly the same way because we live in a patriarchy with extreme levels of misogyny. So uh, women don't have the same power to bounce around words as men do. Men are just not so easily dehumanized. Again, this is pulling straight from Carol Adams' chapter on this, if you want to read more about that. Speciesism also affects men's health. This is another important intersection. Uh, consuming meat and dairy and eggs, they've been linked to many reproductive cancers and disorders for both males and females, but uh, a lot of them specifically impact men, like prostate cancer, and it also affects male impotence. And heightened cultural expectations for men to consume this flesh because meat is so manly, um, that's going to make things a little bit more dangerous for them and increase their likelihood of, ex of experiencing these diet-related diseases. Hunting, farming, slaughter, and vivisection also has serious emotional impacts on men who tend to uh, dominate these fields. So but this is a this is what we know, we call um, toxic masculinity. When men are so pressured to um, incorporate these belief systems that it puts them at risk for physical and emotional harm. Okay, to summarize, our exploitation of non-human animals tends to be linked to notions of masculinity. Concern for non-humans tends to be regulated to the feminine. Minority men have been successfully animalized, through pri though privileged men tend to be resistant. And dominance over non-humans has negative consequences for women, men's health, and society as well as non-humans.
here's some discussion questions to leave you with. I'm just about out of time, but thanks for watching and please visit our website at veganfeministnetwork.com.